will not be in competition with the Supreme Court of the United States of America. God is still on the throne. preach this morning from this subject what happens when a nation rejects God what happens when a nation like the United States rejects God The Trojan Horse is a tale from the Trojan War as told by Homer in his Odyssey about the subterfuge that the Greeks used to enter the city of Troy and end the conflict. After a fruitless 10-year siege, the Greeks constructed a huge wooden horse and hid a select force of men inside that horse. The Greeks pretended to sail away and the Trojans pulled the horse into their city as a victory trophy. That night, the Greek force crept out of the horse and opened the gates for the rest of the Greek army which had sailed back under cover of night. The Greeks entered and destroyed the city of Troy, decisively ending the war. Metaphorically, a Trojan horse has come to mean any trick or stratagem that causes a target to invite a foe into a securely protected environment. For you computer geeks here this morning, it is also associated with malware computer programs presented as useful to install and run on an operating system, but instead drops a malicious payload, often including a back door for unauthorized access to the computer's mainframe. Last week was the most terrible week in the history of the proceedings of the United States Supreme Court. In a landmark decision, on same-sex marriage, the Supreme Court has opened the gates and has allowed into this country a Trojan horse. Never mind that one day a decision was made to blot out everything blacks had fought for, brutalized and beaten fire hoses let on them and dogs sicked on them for the right that blacks should get that whites got just being born in this country. The very next day, the Supreme Court in a landmark decision said that marriage between two men or two women is equal to a marriage between a man and a woman. That's a Trojan horse. The redefinition of marriage will impact the kind of future that we leave our children and our grandchildren. Enormous implications are at stake for us as a nation. A lesbian attorney in Canada correctly said that the real battle is between gay rights and religious freedom. 
freedom of religion, she said, will have to give way to the homosexual agenda. Adolf Hitler was able in his Third Reich to take over all of Western Europe because Hitler's propaganda purported that if you are exposed to an idea long enough, it becomes normal. And the courts have declared through the homosexual agenda that if you are exposed to homosexual marriage long enough, after a while, it becomes normal. There's nothing normal about a man marrying another man. There's nothing normal about two women sexually involved with one another. Because where do you draw the line? If they are born that way, they can be born again. The sign, the sign that the Trojan horse has been pulled into the gates of America is that the church has increased in visibility but has diminished in influence. We have increased visibility but diminishing influence. Mega churches are all over the country. But what's coming out of these pulpits? Health and wealth. Name it and claim it. Counterfeit foolishness. Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on a jackass. And now jackasses are leaving their church riding on jet planes trying to declare that we need to sow a seed in their ministry when men and women are lost and on their way to hell. Uh, after 9-11, after September 11, God, in the words of R.C. Sproul, God was allowed off the reservation for just a few months to fulfill his responsibility to bless America. But once our nation felt secure again, God was safely tucked away, church attendance declined, and the so-called wall of separation of church and state was built even higher. By the way, separation of church and state does not appear anywhere in the U.S. Constitution. That phrase was written by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut in 1802, and people use it when they want to dismiss God from the public square. The Trojan horse. The Trojan horse has been pulled in when so few people control so much of the wealth and power and so many people are homeless, living without medical insurance, trapped in minimum wage jobs and losing their jobs in record numbers while corporate executives plunder their companies and then retire with golden parachutes which guarantee that their feet will never touch the ground. The Trojan horse has been pulled in when African Americans can constitute 13% of the nation's general population but more than 70% of the nation's prison population. The Trojan horse has been pulled in when the jury for the second degree murder trial of George Zimmerman is all white in the state of Florida. A state that during the 2000 presidential election gave the phrase hanging chads 
to the American lexicon and gave George Bush the White House. The Trojan horse has been pulled in. Where not a single African American male sits as a judge on any common or appeals court in several states in this country and Clarence Thomas sits on the United States Supreme Court and seems to be happy to destroy everything that he got by affirmative action. Uh, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson once spoke of the futility of a nation that forgets its heritage. Just as nature abhors a vacuum, a culture which drives every vestige of God from the marketplace of ideas inevitably has sown within it the seeds of its own destruction. How have we as a church contributed to a cultural vacuum that would allow this redefinition of the family to happen with so little resistance? How has the culture been affirmed to feel that they can attack the definition of marriage while the church sings and shouts? I have to admit, my part in the dissolution of the culture, because I am divorced, and the divorce rate in the church is as high as it is in the world. So we cannot stand and proclaim how saintly we are when we've made our own mistakes. Sinfulness is tolerated at the church. Lawlessness is overlooked in the body of Christ. Homosexuality is allowed to run rampant in our churches and we be quiet because we take their money and we accept their leadership because we do not want to be seen as intolerant or bigoted. But God decides what the standards are. God has defined marriage between a man and a woman. And who are we to redefine what God has already defined? Marriage is not a civil institution. Because it has been divinely established. He created them male and female. And for this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Whenever, whenever I preach about or against homosexuality, I'm accused of being bigoted and too traditional and homophobic. Uh, that, that's the emails I get from people uh, who email me when I get through preaching this kind of sermon. And I, I want this sermon on television next Sunday because last night there was a gay pride parade in the city of Houston led by the mayor and her partner. And the church sees nothing wrong with it. Well, I see something wrong with it. And when, why is it that when I preach against homosexuality, I'm homophobic? But I'm not heterophobic when I preach against adultery. I'm not sexophobic when I preach against premarital sex. They have no problem with that 
But when I preach against homosexuality, I'm accused of being intolerant and bigoted. Tolerance does not mean I have to go along with your sinful lifestyle. All unrighteousness is a sin. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about all I've got written down here. Look at, look, look at how Satan has changed the language. They no longer call it same-sex marriage. It is now marriage equality. To put it on par with civil rights. That's offensive to me. It's a human rights issue because I don't think homosexuals ought to be abused just like I don't think children ought to be abused. Just like I don't think wives ought to be abused in their marriages. All abuse is, is a crime and a sin before God. But marriage equality is, is a subterfuge, a Trojan horse to try to get us to be satisfied with their relationships being the same as a relationship between a man and a woman. But again, where do you draw the line? Why can't two men marry four women? Talk back to me if you can. Why can't three women marry one man? Why do we put pedophiles in jail? They were born that way. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Yeah. Lady Gaga said they were born that way. Why do we put murderers in jail? They just got mad. Why do we put rapists in jail? He just wanted a little sex. Where do we draw the line? I wish I had somebody to help me preach it. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God and it is the job of the preacher prophet to tell them it's wrong. American society is in moral and political free fall. God has been expelled from school, dismissed from the courts, and evicted from the culture. In order for you to espouse this view that the Supreme Court has mandated for the nation, you've got to create a God of your own choosing, but he's not the God of the Bible. You've got to create a God who is a deity without sovereignty. A God without wrath. A judge without judgment. And a force without power. You've got to create a civil God who presides over a civil religion who's just good enough to be invoked before a football game. Ah, uh, brothers and sisters, God will not be relegated to the bleachers. God will not be sent to his room upstairs. God will preside over the world he created. I wish I had somebody to help me here. God is not just a God of love. God is a God of wrath. God is not just a God of justice. God is a God of holiness. And the day of reckoning is coming for America. But if my people, hey, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, I got, 
I got four things I want to say about that. I just got time for two of them this morning. But when a nation rejects God, you have to substitute something in its place. And you have to substitute pride. Uh, Muhammad Ali, who was the greatest, uh, said it's not bragging if you can do it. He, he, he predicted which round he was going to knock his opponent out in. And he and Howard Cosell would spar with one another. And Cosell would say, I don't like you because you brag too much. And Ali said, it's not bragging if you can do it. And uh, once Ali was on his plane going to Africa, and uh, the stewardess, they were calling him at, the, at, at that time, uh, the stewardess, now they're called flight attendants, but they were called stewardesses at that time. Uh, the stewardess said to uh, Muhammad Ali, the greatest, uh, you have to sit down. The plane is about to take off. You need to be seated and fasten your seatbelt. And Muhammad Ali did not miss a beat because he was quick in, 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 on his feet. He could think uh, real fast, real cute, real funny sayings. He turned and said to her, honey, Superman does not need a seatbelt. <laughs> and the stewardess just so happened to be quick on her feet as well. And she looked back at him and said, honey, Superman doesn't need an airplane. Take your seat and sit down. Somebody gonna get that on the way to Papa though. God will not be in competition with the Supreme Court of the United States of America. God is still on the throne. God still decides what nation rises and what nation falls. And if we substitute God with our human pride, God knows how to put us back in our place. Because he's the only one able to talk about death in the past tense. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. He's the only one on his way to where he's coming back from. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. I wish I had a witness here. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. He's Jehovah Shalom, the God who is our peace. He's Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. There is none like him. And any nation, any preacher, any people who gets lifted up in pride and tries to exalt yourself above the throne of God, he'll put you back in your place. I wish I had somebody to help me preach right here. God's plans will not be thwarted. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. I don't care what the Supreme Court says, they're not going to marry at Lily Grove Church. Now, I know, I know that President Obama says that this does not affect the church. The church can do whatever it's been doing, but that's a Trojan horse. Because I predict, I'm not a prophet, I'm not even the son of a prophet. But I predict that in the near future, they will come to the church to be married. And if we don't marry them, we will be in violation of a federal statute. And we will lose our tax-exempt status because we are in violation of what the Supreme Court has laid down as the law of the land. But I still believe God's going to protect his church. God's going to protect his preacher. God's going to protect his people. Because if my people, I need somebody to help me right here, which are called by my name, instead of having pride, 
humble yourself. All this stuff that's going on in the country. In the National Baptist Convention, they're fighting over who's going to be president. I wish I had somebody to help me. They need propellers for their helicopter. They want tailor-made suits and French cuff shirts while the people are on their way to hell in a handbasket. The church is making noise, but no progress. The church is making steps, but not moving forward because we're trying to be all things to all people. We are not a school. We are a body of Christ. Come on, help me here. We are not a civic club. We are the body of Christ. We are not some social institution. We've been created in the image of God. And the church is not like any other place in the world. I will not marry them at the church. Now that's my declaration of independence. I'm God's preacher. And if I stay under God's umbrella, he's promised to protect me. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind, I wish I had a witness, if my people, which are called by my name, instead of being proud of yourself, humble yourself. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, the Bible says in due time, God will exalt you. Ever got a witness here? If you humble yourself, God will raise you up. But if you raise yourself up, God will bring you down. And God knows what to use to bring you down. This, this, this man who's a traitor to the United States in hiding from the strongest nation on earth and a nation like Russia that can hardly pay their bills thumbs their nose at the greatest country on earth to say to President Obama the, the strongest man on the planet catch me if you can They're laughing at us because we are fiddling while Rome is burning. The country is in moral free fall and the president is on the phone congratulating two women who married Friday night. I, I want this to be on television next Sunday. I wish I could take my vote back. I, I know I didn't vote for him to be my pastor. I voted for him to be my president. But you ought to have some moral ground to stand on. You ought to choose a hill that you're going to die on. As the leader of the free world, you need to have, Mr. President, a moral conscience. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Rome, the greatest empire in the history of antiquity, imploded from the inside. Because if same-sex marriage becomes the law of the land of all 50 states, where do you draw the line? Yeah. Our children's future hangs in the balance because it's wrong to go to school and read from a book entitled, My Two Daddies. Yeah. 
I wish I had a witness here. The Bible is our rule of faith and practice. Somebody ought to help me here. The Supreme Court is not God. The flag is not the cross. The Constitution is not the Bible. And God bless America is not my doxology. My doxology is praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures. I wish I had somebody to help me. And if we are going to give God praise, then we've got to come to God's book. Pride and arrogance must be crucified if God will get glory. The second thing that will happen when a nation forgets God is prayerlessness. If my people, I wish I had a Bible reading, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, get, get rid of your pride, and pray. Prayerlessness. Prayer is a statement of weakness. Prayer is a state of dependence. Prayer is saying, God, I can't, but you can. Too much prayer at the church is anemic, antiseptic, formal, repetitious, and long-winded. The church is dying on its feet because it's not living on its knees. I need somebody to help me right here. You, you, you remember when your grandmother's knees were black? That's from prayer. And, and when she couldn't get down on her knees, she'd sit in a rocking chair and start humming. If I can't say a word, I just wave my hand. I wouldn't have a religion. I couldn't feel sometimes. If you're talking about Jesus, he's a friend of mine. People stay outside for prayer and come in for the singing of the choir. There's no power in singing. The power is in prayer. If you pray and pray right, the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. I'm through now. I, I, I got some more down here, but I got to save it for 11 o'clock. I got to hunk it off right here. But Second Chronicles is written when Solomon has built the temple. And he prays and he asks God to be present in the temple. And God says to them, I'll be with you as long as you meet certain conditions. The America wants just the blessings from God. But tied to God's blessings is obedience to God's word. God is not some cosmic Santa Claus who's just passing out blessings to folk who are doing what they want to do. God is the dread sovereign of the universe. God is the king of this world and God decides who he wants to bless. Tied into obedience to his word. If my people which are called by my name. I need to back up. If my people, that's a, that's a, that's a contingency. That's a condition. If my people, 
I, I need to go forward a little bit. My people. You better be sure you in that conversation of my people. My people love my word. My people obey my statutes. My people hear my voice. My people shout at the calling of my name. My people hear my voice. My people attend my church. My people love my preacher. My people shout at the mention of my goodness. My people are excited about my wonderful works. My people can't keep quiet about my excellent mercy. My people. Which are called by my name. If you, if you humble yourself, somebody ought to help me preach a minute. If you put yourself in God's hands, they'll talk about you, but they can't stop you. They'll lie on you, but they can't overwhelm you. They'll criticize you, but they can't take your power. Have I got a witness here? They'll be wondering why you're carrying on on Sunday morning with all the stuff that's going on in your family. They'll wonder why you still got to shout when you lost your job. Why you still raising your hands in church when your son is in prison. Why are you still giving God the glory when you got aches and pains in your body. It's because you got a history with God. You got a track record with God. You've seen God work in some wonderful ways. you watch God open doors. you watch God make a way out of nowhere. You've seen God put food on your table. you watch God make your enemy your footstool. God kept you till your hair turned gray. God provided for you when you didn't have a job. You didn't work for a whole year, but you still had food every day. You still had a house to live in. Because if you trust God, he will provide. Is there anybody here? Know that if God's people who are called by his name would just humble themselves. Humble means to get down on your knees. Don't pray standing up all the time. Sometimes you got to get down on your knees and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. This is more than I can handle. This boy is breaking my heart. This girl about to give me a heart attack. God, I need your help. And God will stop them on the highway. Tears will be coming down their eyes and they won't know what they're crying for. That's because God heard your prayer and went to see about that boy on drugs. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? You'll go to the doctor and they had an x-ray last time and then you come to the doctor this time and they can't see what's wrong with you because before you got there, God moved what was your problem. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? You were supposed to lose your house, but the bank changed their mind because God went there and turned the heart of the banker. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? He may not come when you want him to come, but if you wait on it, if you wait on it, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew our strength come on help me preach a minute they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not get weary they shall walk and not faint why don't you grab somebody tell them God is 
in control. God is still in control. God will, God will make a way out of no way. You brought me from a mighty long way. If the Lord been good to you, why don't you hug somebody, shake somebody's hand, tell them you don't know like I know. Tell them I don't care what the Supreme Court said. God is still in charge. I know he's all right. Christians ought to do like the homosexuals are doing. We ought to come out the closet. Just like they making noise, we ought to make some noise. Just like they're declaring who their God is, we need to declare who our God is. Our God is a strong tower. Our God is a rock in a weary land. Our God is a shelter in the time of a storm. Our God is a friend of sinners. If you're lost and on your way to hell, God is to be your friend. Thank you for tuning in to A Call to Joy. It is our prayer that the Word of God has brought joy, strength, and faith to your life. We would love to have you as our guest at Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church, where we are exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. For your convenience, we have a 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship service every Sunday morning and 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. Lily Grove is located at 7034 Till Wester Street, Houston, Texas, 77021. Or feel free to visit our website at www.lilygrove.org. Until next week, God has called us to a life of joy. <laughs>